Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a joy to be here together with uh, lots of friends. Um, Peter introduced me as uh, JP, uh, and that's all good and fine. But there may be somebody here that doesn't know me. Uh, JP stands for John Peters. Uh, that, uh, that's my given name. Uh, but my friends call me JP, um, or Peter in the case of one or two here. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be here with you, and uh, I'm grateful for the privilege to uh, spend this morning uh, together with you. Um, and if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to uh, turn to the book of John, John chapter 14. Uh, this is probably my favorite or one of my favorite chapters in, uh, in the whole Bible. Um, and probably the book of John is, is, is my favorite gospel, but I particularly love chapter 14. And uh, there's so much uh, that our Lord uh, Jesus tells us that, uh, that's a comfort to us. And so I particularly love this chapter. But before we um, look at some of those verses out of that chapter, I want to begin this morning, uh, first of all, uh, with a time of prayer, and then, uh, and then I have a question that I would like to begin with. So would you bow together with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I want to just ask that you would be in our midst here this morning, that you would uh, guide us by your spirit that you have poured out uh, into this world as our comforter. And so I pray that you would lead us into all truth and that our hearts would be uh, good and fruitful soil into which your word can fall and uh, take root. So, Father, I just ask for uh, your blessing to be upon us. May everything I say um, be uh, simply as a channel uh, through which you can speak. And so we just ask that you would uh, be glorified and magnified here this morning in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you, uh, if anybody that is interested, um, I, would, uh, I would entitle uh, the message for this morning, Hope and Uncertainty. That is the theme uh, for this morning, Hope and Uncertainty. But before we uh, go further in that theme, I would like to ask you the question, where are you going? Where are you going? And the reason I ask that question is because there is so much un in uncertainty in this world. There are so many things that are competing for our attention. There are so many things that are clouding um, our ability to think clearly. And, and one of the things uh, simply that uh, causes so much confusion is, I think by and large, the uh, Christians here in North America, we have it so good, and we neglect God's word which um, produces a lack of clarity in us. It produces a lack of direction because we are not informed or instructed by the inspired word of God. And so the question, where are you going, is, is not just a question about whether you're going to heaven or hell. But it's, you can apply that question this morning to any area of your life. Where are you going with your family? Where are you going as an individual uh, in your walk with the Lord or as an individual in your, in your job or in your business? Where are you going? There's um, many of you may be familiar with Alice and the Adventures in Wonderland. And I'd like to read just a, a short little um, conversation that she has with a Cheshire cat. And so this quote is from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. And she comes, as she's walking, she comes to a place in the road where she meets the, the cat, and she says, Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only keep walking long enough. And isn't that the case for all of us, that we're, we're going 
we're walking along this road of life, but do we know where we're going? And, um, and as the cat says, if you don't know where you're going, well, it doesn't matter which way you take. You're, gonna, you're bound to get somewhere. But the question is, where do you want to go? That is the challenge I want to place before you first off because of the, just as an encouragement to think, to, to gain clarity, to look through the troubles maybe that are, that are in your life or that you are faced with. We need to learn to look beyond the circumstances that we may find ourselves in so that we can uh, hold on to hope, hope in a time of uncertainty. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to uh, follow along in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That far in the reading of God's word, and, uh, and that's where I want to spend the, the, the portion of time together this morning uh, in, those, in those six verses. So first of all, uh, I want to just draw our attention to the context of, where, of what Jesus is saying here. The disciples are confused. They are suddenly faced with great uncertainty. The disciples are still thinking that Jesus is going to set up an earthly kingdom in which he will rule. During their time together these last days before Jesus is crucified, they are still arguing about who is the greatest among them. Who is the one that's going to be sitting at Jesus' right hand and on his left hand? All the things that Jesus says to them this, this particular evening is messing with the way that they have been thinking. It's causing confusion and uncertainty. And I wanted to read to you some of the statements that Jesus makes to them before we get to John chapter 14. And uh, you're welcome, they're, they're found in chapter 13, so... Feel free to follow. First of all, in John 13, verse 7, Jesus says, Jesus answered and said to them, or said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. In verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. In verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. In verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. And then verses 36 through 38, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Can you just, as an individual, as a disciple of Jesus, somebody that's been following and investing three years of your life uh, following this man, and now he says things like, uh, I need to leave. And all this time you've been thinking that this, this man is going to be setting up an earthly kingdom. He is going to overthrow uh, the Romans and set up his own kingdom, of which we will be a great part of. And now he says, I'm leaving. 
And then he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Not now. And he says things like, one of you is going to betray me. And then in verse 38, he says to Peter, the leader of the group, after, make, after Peter makes such a declaration that he is going to die for Jesus, Jesus says to him, no, you're not. You're going, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. I mean, if you've invested three, li- three years into following a, this man and he starts saying these types of things, I think that's going to, ca- that is cause for some confusion. How many of you dads or moms ever leave the home to run some errands and if you have small children, they want to go with you and you say, no, you can't come with me now. I have, I have some things to do. How, what, what is their response often? Do they just say, okay, see you later? Sometimes maybe that is the case. But how many of you have experienced that same situation where you need to go and do something, the kids want to come along, you say no, and they, they, they throw a fit because they want to come along and they don't understand why they can't. I wonder if the disciples here, they kind of had a fit because of the things that they were hearing. Those statements by Jesus leave the disciples troubled. They leave them flustered or in a statement of agitated confusion. And so in this uncertainty, the disciples, they need hope. And I find it incredibly interesting that the one who gives them hope is the one who ought to be troubled the most. I mean, in verse uh, 21 of chapter 13, Jesus says that he is troubled in spirit. And then he follows that with, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Jesus is is troubled in spirit because of the things that are going to be happening. So they need hope in a time of uncertainty. And so verse 1 of chapter 14, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So first of all, let not your heart be troubled. How could they not let their heart be troubled after hearing all that talk about being left alone and saying that, uh, and sayings that didn't make sense. How could they not be troubled? But Jesus encourages them and is in effect saying to them, stop. How many of you parents have ever told your children when they are kind of unreasonable and don't understand why they can't come along and you take them aside for a moment and you say, stop. And you bring them back to reality. And Jesus is doing that here. He says, stop, in effect. And he turns their attention to something that they have lived with for years, from childhood on. So he says, first of all, let not your heart be troubled. And then the attention is turned to, you believe in God. Because the disciples, they had believed in God. They had grown up. In this Jewish tradition, they most likely would have been instructed in the ways of the, uh, the Torah, the Old Testament. They had believed in God. They would have witnessed the, the sacrifices in the temple and all of these things. You believe in God in whom that they had not seen. And now someone that they can see, Jesus is with them in person. Believe also in me, he says. You believe in God. Believe also in me, the one that they could see. So how often is our heart troubled because our attention is on uncertain things rather than on certain things? I would like for you to to take a moment and just to, to ask yourself that question. How often is your heart troubled because your attention is on uncertain things? rather than on the sure things. It is so easy in this day and age to give our attention to all of the uncertain things. We live in a, we live in a time where so, there is so much uncertainty politically, uh, morally, financially, 
uh, maybe it's even in, in relationships, there are so many things that can be uncertain and that if we are not careful, will cause our hearts to be troubled. So how often is your heart troubled because your attention is on uncertain things rather than on the certain? And the word of Jesus to you and to me is, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And that is the challenge for each of us today. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so when I ask that question, where are you going? It is with that thought in mind that we have one in our lives that guides us on, on sure foundations, along sure paths, so that we can get to that destination that is uh, a sure thing and not just clouded in uncertainty. We will, we will and we are faced with uncertainties in this world, and it is critical that we keep a level head. It's, it's critical that we keep a level head. That way, we know where we want to go, unlike Alice in the story. Maybe, maybe among this many people, uh, there is someone here this morning where you find yourself at a crossroads. And because of all of the uncertainty in your life, you don't know which direction you should take. And because of that uncertainty, you could go down any path, and it's going to lead you somewhere, but is that truly where you want to end up? And so then I encourage us to look at the one that is certain. Look at the one that is able to guide us along the sure paths so that when we are faced with that crossroads, that we can make the, the proper turn. One of the dangers and uncertainty is that we tend to make rash decisions that are often based in fear, in lies, in pressure. Maybe it's in money. And like Alice, we say, so long as I get somewhere, just not here. A lot of people are tempted to make rash decisions financially when they are in a difficult spot. As long as I just get away from here, and that can lead us into bigger trouble. I heard a testimony just yesterday of, of a missionary to China that was uh, a great encouragement to me. Uh, his name was Robert uh, Jaffrey. He was the heir to what is today uh, the Globe and Mail, uh, which is one of the largest newspapers in Toronto. It was his father that that had that uh, newspaper. At the time, it was called the Toronto Globe. And so Robert Jaffrey Jr. was saved when he was a teenager. And uh, it was in the early 1900s, during a time when some of you may, may, may know the name Standard Oil, which is a company that John Rockefeller uh, started. And it was a massive company. And uh, Robert Jaffrey started, he had started, after his conversion, started to learn Chinese. And uh, this company, Standard Oil, wanted him to come and work for them. They had offered him a huge salary, and he had turned it down. They had written him back, and they had doubled the offer of the salary, and he had turned it down. And they had sent him a telegram again and said, at any price, and he had written back with one sentence and said, your offer is big, but your job is too small. And he went to the mission field in China, and thousands came to know the Lord through, through his work and started churches and a seminary in China. See, many of us don't have such a, a clarity of God's leading that we turn down fortunes for small jobs and accept measly paychecks or measly worldly rewards, possibly, danger and disease. He died in a Japanese prison, but for a work that is much bigger than we are. 
And we cannot, in a time of uncertainty, we cannot uh, make clear decisions like that because we are influenced. Maybe it is money for some. Maybe it is family pressures. Maybe it is fear or lies that we believe that we've gathered from who knows where. So we will and we are faced with uncertainties in this world, and it is critical that we keep a level head and that we do not make rash decisions so that we are in a place where we say, just get me out of here as long as I go somewhere. So the advantage of Jesus leaving, it's hard to see past the problems, but blessings often await on the other side. I want to turn our attention to John chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. John 16, 6 and 7, they say, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. There is an advantage for the disciples for Jesus to leave. And that advantage wasn't just for the disciples at that time. It has also been to our advantage. And then in verses 19 and 20 to 22 of that same chapter, chapter 16. On the other side of pain is joy. 16, 19 to 22. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because of her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. And that is, that is our reality, is that so often on the other side of pain, there is joy. But we need to learn to look past the problems that we find ourselves in. And that's a difficult thing. Because they command so much attention. But what about Jesus? We've been talking about the disciples and the fact that their heart was troubled. And I said to you before that the one that they were receiving encouragement from the one that ought to have been troubled the most. In John 12, 27, we read, and this is Jesus saying, and he says, My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. I so much appreciate Jesus' maturity and his, his strength throughout his life in every situation that he was in, whether he was tempted of the devil in the, in the wilderness or when he is faced with tough questions and when, the, and when the reality of what his purpose is sinks in in the Garden of Gethsemane, he seems to be able to look past the difficulty to something else that, where the joy is. Chapter 13, 21, which we read earlier. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. That's a grievous thing if you when you come to that realization that maybe somebody that you that is in your inner circle is going to betray you. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, Matthew tells us that he was exceedingly sorrowful. But in, in that moment of truth, Jesus fully realizing what he was in, where he was at, he said, not my will, but your will be done. And with such courage, you know, he gets up and he goes and wakes up the ones that should have been watching and encouraging him. He wakes them up and he says, let's go. My captor is coming. 
And as they approach him and they ask, you know, where is this Jesus of, of Nazareth? He says, I am he. That is courage. Jesus was able to see beyond the current situation that he was in. And he is our example. We need to learn to see beyond the present, to see beyond the problem, to see the sure thing rather than just the uncertain things. He continues to draw their attention in verse 2 of chapter 14 by saying, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you, or I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. There's a purpose for him leaving. And you parents, you know, if you have gone away and your children are a little bit restless because they can't come along with daddy or mommy, and if you say, uh, you stay here, I'll bring you a treat. What does that do? Okay, well, it, it, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, it, maybe that's not enough for, for certain children, but for some, I'm sure, that's enough. And they're, they're happy and they're just excited and waiting for that treat when mom or dad comes back. And isn't that what we have here? We have a treat. We have a, we have a, a mansion, a home, a home that is being prepared for us by the, by the one that, that saves us. Another advantage for Jesus leaving is him preparing a place, drawing their attention to something that they will get not now, but in the future. Not immediate gratification, but something that is better. And in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus isn't just selfishly leaving for his own uh, means. There's a purpose. And he is the one reminding the disciples of the benefits that they are going to receive as a result. I am going to prepare a place for you so that I can come and get you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18 says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now you and I have the privilege of having the mysteries of God entrusted to us. We are ambassadors, the Bible says, of, of, of these mysteries. And maybe there is someone in your circle that is troubled with uncertainty. And you are able to come alongside and speak comfort. Because you yourselves have been comforted with the comfort with which only God provides. Maybe your friend, maybe your brother or sister, maybe your coworker, they have not experienced that yet. But you are the one through which they will hear about it. So therefore comfort one another with these words. And even here within the church, as, as the body of Christ, here and abroad, to comfort each other with these words. And in verse 4, he says, uh, chapter 14 of John, and where, I go, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. You know where I'm going, he says. Jesus had spoken to them many times about going to the Father. He had spoken to them about the way of life. I'm not quite sure why the disciples weren't getting it. But he had spoken to them so often about the Father. And the fact that Jesus and the Father are one. And maybe Jesus was testing the disciples. I'm not sure. But in verse 5, Thomas, as if he's kind of frustrated, he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And Thomas, you know, Thomas is doubting Thomas. He, all, he needs to be reassured more than the others. But maybe that's our question often. I don't know where to go. When our mind is in a frenzy, it is difficult to see clearly, just like the disciples that night. Their mind was clouded with well, their paradigm had, had just fallen apart. What they were thinking was going to happen was falling apart. 
And so we need to learn to see beyond those problems. So how do we do this? How do we learn to see more clearly? Three ways that I can think of is to become very familiar with the way. Second, to become very familiar and confident with the truth. And then to actually put it into practice. In other words, not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of it. And as we do it, more clarity comes. As we are obedient to a small amount of truth that, that's been revealed to us, God is faithful in revealing more. And so we need to become familiar with the way, and we need to be confident in the truth. When things are not clear, we have a hard time knowing uh, which way to go. We are flustered and often in, in an agitated state of confusion. And as I mentioned before, it's easy then to make rash decisions. We are more easily led astray and believe lies. We lose hope. And so it's important to have clarity and to have proper direction. And God's word is our direction. As I was reading different things about clarity and about proper guidance in our lives, I came across a short story that was written in the Campus Life magazine many years ago. And, uh, and, and I thought it spoke very well to having proper direction in our lives. And so listen to the story. In November 1975, 75 convicts started digging a secret tunnel designed to bring them up at the other side of the wall of Saltillo Prison in northern Mexico. On April 18, 1976, guided by pure genius, they tunneled up into the nearby courtroom in which many of them had been sentenced. The surprised judges returned all 75 to jail. I just thought that was amazing. Digging for freedom, but simply digging themselves back into the prison where, in which they, from which they came, just by a different means. So we need to be clear and have proper direction. So what about you? Maybe you are in what feels to you today like a jail. And you're trying to dig yourself out. We want to go somewhere just as long as we, as we get out of here. Maybe that may be your temptation here this morning. And I want to encourage you that to look beyond the difficulty and to look to something that is more sure. And that is the foundation that, that Christ has laid. To look to the sure, the certainty of his word. Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then finally in verse 6 of John chapter 14. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is not the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples. If you continue reading, there are more things that Jesus says to them that could be cause for uncertainty. But Jesus is the one that comforts them and that guides them. Jesus is the one that, through the Holy Spirit, comforts and guides us today. First of all, he is the way. Jesus is not just the person who shows or directs you to the right path. He is the path. David said of God's word that I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. God's word is a path. It is a, it is a light along the path for David to be able to walk confidently. Maybe not to be able to see too far ahead, but to walk with surety where he is walking. John 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Acts tells us that there is no salvation with anyone else other than in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the way. So in whatever jail you might find yourself in, whatever difficulty, I encourage you to look to Jesus as the way out of that situation. 
that may mean humility, that may mean some difficulty, but difficulty is okay. There's nothing wrong with difficulty. Jesus experienced difficulty. And then he says that he is the truth. The best book or message on Jesus is the Bible. You can read, read many commentaries that are going to give you some information about Jesus. But I have found that the best commentary on Jesus is the Bible itself. So don't forsake it. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king then? In John 18, 37, Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And that is so important. When we are walking along that path of uncertainty, and we've come, we come to a place where we're a crossroads, he says that those who are of the truth, they hear his voice. And you may find Jesus, maybe it's a quiet whisper in the, through you know, that still small voice. Or maybe you excuse it as a gut feeling saying to you, go this way. It may not make sense to you at the moment, but go this way. To hear the truth. Once when a stubborn disputer seemed unconvinced, Abraham Lincoln said, well, let's see how many legs has a cow. Four, of course, came the, re the reply disgustedly. That's right, agreed Lincoln. Now suppose you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs would the cow have? Why, five, of course, was the confident reply. Now that's where you're wrong, said Lincoln. Call a, calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. And, and that's where we find ourselves in today. Um, truth that is relative. Every person seems to have their own truth. And that is deception. There is the truth. And according to the scriptures, it is God's holy word. Jesus says that he is the truth. So everyone has a story. Everyone has experiences, some good and some bad. The truth, however, is the truth. And it doesn't, the truth doesn't change based on my experience and your experience. That will remain. So, clarity. And then lastly, he says, he is the life. Christ is the author, according to Acts, and the giver of life, natural, spiritual, and eternal. He is the way of life, or as some put it, he is the living way. So what an exciting thing for us to be able to walk with Jesus as the living way. Not to a way of death, but to a way that leads to life. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So let me ask you again, where, where are you going? Are you walking along in your life uh, in a hopeless situation and you are in need of hope in a time of uncertainty? I simply want to encourage you to look uh, to the Lord for, for direction. But not only that, we are a body of Christ. We are instructed in the scriptures to comfort one another with these words. Sometimes if we have some difficulties and if we share that with somebody, it, just verbalizing it makes it much easier to bear. So let's be faithful in, in, in bearing one another's burdens. But not only that, encouraging others to go beyond their problems or their burdens, to come to a place of life, to be, come to a place of clarity, to come to a place of freedom. And so one way we can apply this is by using the word spec. And this would be my encouragement to each and every one of us. If you use spec as an acrostic, 
Maybe there's something that you've heard today, and as you consider uh, your walk with God, maybe there's a certain sin to avoid in order to gain clarity, in order to go beyond the problems. So first of all, S, is there a sin to avoid in your life? Secondly, is there a promise that you need to claim? The enemy is uh, just walking around seeking to uh, kill and destroy. And he wants us to believe all sorts of lies. And many, uh, many people today with, with the, uh, just the open world that we live in with the internet, there are so many false teachings out there. So it, is there a promise that you need to claim? Is there an example in the scriptures that you need to follow? That's E. And then C, is there a command for you to obey? And then is there perhaps, have you gained some knowledge about who God is through that passage that you need to apply? A sin to avoid, promise to claim, example to follow, a command to obey, or knowledge to apply? This morning, I want to close with 1 John chapter 5. I just want to read some verses there, and then we will pray. So in 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 9, we read, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us, that God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he, do not, he who does not have the Son does not have, the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Is that your testimony? Do you believe the testimony that God has given of his Son? And do you have the Son? And as Jesus says to his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me, if your heart is troubled. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we give you much praise this morning for, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for, for your word and for the encouragement uh, that, that it is to us. For even so many years later, you say to us, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. And so, Father, I, I pray that if there is anyone here that does not believe in you, that as you said yourself, that no one can come to you unless you draw them. You are the way. And so I pray that you would draw them. I pray those of us who who have called on you, that we would be faithful in living out the word that you have given us, that we would be courageous, and that we would not just be caught up in our own uh, troubles, but that we would learn to see beyond our current circumstances to something that is greater. And just, just like Jesus was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. I pray that the heavenly dwellings that Jesus is preparing for us would be in our view and that it would be a place that we would be excited for. So Father, I pray for each family and person that you would strengthen them and that in moments of uncertainty they would be able to be led and that they would be guided uh, by the sure word by the Holy Spirit that will lead us into all truth. 
In Jesus' name, amen.